Hi everyone, welcome again to our lovely topic, assets and bases, and we're going through another very important part of assets and bases. The last week together, we spoke about titration, and uh, we spoke about the importance of it as being a procedure, a chemical procedure that helps us to, to, helps us to determine the concentration of an unknown substance by using a known substance, particularly in that case, it was an acid and a base. All right. Now, just so we may recap on the important parts about that, we can go through quickly the steps in a titration. Remember what each particular uh, entity stands for. So the first part is that you must have a burette, which is part of our apparatus, and the burette must contain the standard solution or the titrant. Please remember how to define a standard solution, a solution of whose concentration it is accurately known. Now, when you are cleaning or rinsing the, 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 the burette, you don't use distilled water, not at all. You actually use the standard solution, the very solution that you're going to place in the burette, you use it to rinse the burette. Why is that? Okay, this is because the drops of water that you use, if you use distilled water, will change the concentration of the acid or base, the standard solution, and make it more dilute. So it, it, it will affect your results. So that's something that must be remembered all the time. Okay, remember that the pipette is used to measure the volume of the analyte, the unknown substance, to place it into a conical flask. The conical flask houses the unknown substance whose concentration is not known, the analyte, as it were. And then the known solution, standard solution, is in the burette. You set up your burette on a stand and place the conical flask underneath the burette on a white towel for clearer color comparison. So the color changes can be seen. So obviously, place an accurately measured volume of the analyte into the conical flask, also known as the Ellen Mayer flask, using the pipette and a few drops of an indicator. And I want to speak about an indicator because it's very important to understand what type of indicators are very necessary for what type of titration. Okay, remember that when you're measuring the volume of your standard solution, note the initial volume, note the final volume when end point has been reached. End point, the point when the indicator changes color. That's the purpose of the indicator, to show you that now you can close your tab. Now, chemically speaking, you have reached your equivalence point. You now have stoichiometrically equivalent amounts of acid and base enough to be able to give you a salt and water. You have completely neutralized. And that's important because the indicator will change color at the end point. There you are. The end point is the point in a titration where the indicator changes color. Be careful not to overshoot. Overshooting means that now that you've reached end point and there's a color change, the tap is still open. The acid or the base, the standard solution is still trickling into the conical flask. That's overshooting. Your results do not become accurate in that case. Since it's a chemical procedure, an experimental procedure, a couple of important safety rules should be noted. First up, Wear protective equipment. You have got your gloves, your lab coat, your goggles as well. Clean all the spills. That's very important. And if, if ever uh, any of the chemicals are spills onto your skin, just wash that with running water all the time. Don't overshoot. Don't forget that. Don't overshoot. Now, here's a table that shows you a list of possible indicators that one can use for a certain type of a titration. It makes sense as to the choice of an indicator will depend on the type of acid on base that are reacting. For an example, bromothiamol blue is a preferred indicator when you've got a strong acid and a strong base reacting together. You want to pick that one because the color change of bromothiamol blue is close to the equivalence point of your acid strong acid and strong base. So if you look at it, strong acid and strong base, they eventually give you a solution uh, with a pH of almost seven or just neutral there. So the bromodamo blue, the preferred indicator, works on a pH range of 6,0 to 7,6. I haven't put on the table the color changes that come through as well. 
what if what, what about a weak acid and a strong base what if i'm reacting a weak acid as well as a strong base phenolphthalein is the preferred indicator why is that it's because its range or where it works is from 8.3 to 10.0 notice that it's a strong base and a weak acid reacting together the solution formed will definitely be basic in nature so you need phenolphthalein whose ph range is 8.3 to 10 that's my preferred indicator right there now when it comes to a strong acid and uh, and a weak base so the acid is strong but the base is weak who do we pick methyl red there we go methyl red very important why strong acid solution acidic something less than uh, at least less than seven also uh, you need something with a range which is uh, close to the acidic range the equivalence point of your strong acid and your weak base and therefore you have methyl red whose um, pH range is between 4,4 as well as 6,2, right? We spoke as well about uh, what's, why, it's, why it's important for us to be able to understand uh, the calculations of uh, titration. CAVA of a CBVB is called NA of a NB, which I'm going to use on my next video when I start doing the questions and I can't wait to get there. All right, standard solution. Okay, we know it, but how do we prepare it? two methods okay so the standard solution which is a solution of arcuate non concentration can be prepared using two methods first one you can dissolve a solid in distilled water do the measurements do the mass measurements as well get everything clear there or you can dilute a concentrated solution okay let's start off with the first method what do we do when you're dissolving a solid when you want to prepare a standard solution so very simple so you take a particular solid. Let's say you're preparing, for an example, a standard solution of potassium hydroxide. Potassium hydroxide, and you want to dissolve the solid in uh, distilled water. So you calculate the mass of the solid, 0 0,3 grams, right? And uh, needed to, to make the required volume and concentration of the standard solution. So you measure the mass of that particular solid, and then you add uh, the solid in half of the required volume of distilled water in a volumetric flask. So let's just visualize this. So this is my volumetric flask. Take my solid, put it in, and then add water, and then swirl just to dissolve evenly the solid in the volumetric flask. Then top up to the required volume with more distilled water. And so it means now when you have done that, measured your volume of the water that you used, the mass of the solid that you used, using the formula, concentration is equal to mass M right there is equal to uh, capital letter M, which is the molar mass of your solid, which in this case, I will use potassium hydroxide and then volume V, which is the volume that you used uh, for that particular uh, solution. Then you can find the concentration. Then now you know the concentration. It's a non-concentration. It's definitely your standard solution. Also as well, there's another methodology that you can use you dilute a more concentrated solution. Let's keep in mind what we know about concentrated solutions and dilute solutions. So concentrated solutions, there's just uh, more of the substance, more solute than the solvent. Now, if you were to dilute a certain concentrated solution and you note your volumes that you used, you will be able to get a standard solution whose concentration you know. Now, notice that the number of moles of the concentrated solution and the number of moles of the dilute solution are the same. So if that's the case, then this is what happens. Now, you take the concentrated solution, right, and measure a certain volume of it. We'll call it the stock solution now. The concentrated solution, the stock solution, right? So you take that volume of the stock solution, you know the concentration, of the stock solution, let's call them C1. C1 is the concentration or the initial concentration of the concentrated. V1 is the initial volume. So I take my concentrated solution, I know its, vo its volume, V1, I know its concentration, C1. Notice that C1 multiplied by V1, C1, V1, is equal to the number of moles of the concentrated, which is the same as the number of moles of the dilute. Then now when I dilute, so simple, I've taken my particular uh, 
volume with this concentration, then I add water into it. I dilute, add more proportion of water. I measure the volume of water that I put right there. And I then now I say to myself, oh, okay, so V2 becomes the volume or the final volume. Remember when I say final volume, I'm including the volume of the concentrated and the volume of the water that I put across. This is why it's important that you notice that V2 is the sum of the amount of distilled water that you use for dilution in the initial volume V1, you add them together. And what am I looking for now? I'm looking for C2, which is the concentration of the dilute solution, C2. And the formula to use is C1 V1 is equal to C2 V2, detailing that the number of moles of your acid um, or base uh, in its concentrated solution and in its dilute solution are definitely going to be the same. So always keep that in mind. C1 V1 is equal to C2 V2, a very important formula in terms of how you can be able to get to a point of calculating uh, the concentration of the dilute solution, the, uh, the, the standard solution that you're looking for. Now, in terms of applications of acids and bases, basically, this is just a very short uh, part where you can just read for yourself, but also let me just explain very quickly. So acids and bases are applied in the production of chlorine, which is super important in the production of chlorine. Now, chlorine is one of the major products that we need uh, for everyday life, and it's a very useful compound in the chemical industry. So in the chloroalkali process, which is an, a process of the electrolysis of sodium chloride solution, which is just known as brine. Here, yeah, brine, there you are. It's a high concentration of um, salt sodium chloride. Now the reactions that take place are these ones. So you also definitely have your acids and bases being involved. There's there your hydroxides there. So you can see that that's another application of, uh, of acids and bases in the production of chlorine. Because what do you need right there for that production? Um, you need um, sodium hydroxide as well. You need water. You need a high concentration of the salt, sodium chloride, and there you have it at the end of the day. You've got your chlorine being produced in the chloroalkali industry. Also as well, please keep in mind that you can use acids and bases uh, for hair. And healthy hair has a pH of between 4,5 and 5,5. Now, hair products, they contain acids. Weak acids, um, sometimes even weak bases as well. Now, weak acids, when applied to hair, they make the hair pretty soft and shinier. And how do they do that? They close the cuticle, right? So it's very important. And these products are pretty good for retaining hair to its natural shape, right? Um, when you apply an alkali or a base substance to hair, they open up the cuticle, making the hair look a bit dull and feel a bit rough. So acids and bases are used in hair products, um, also in such products such as dyes or bleaches to make uh, it easier for hair color to be removed. And, and while we're speaking about the coloring of hair, notice that uh, the outer layer of the hair shaft, uh, its cuticle, must be opened for permanent color to be deposited into the hair. So, so once the cuticle is open, the dye reacts with the inner portion of the hair, which is the cortex, to deposit or remove the color. So these are pretty much some of the happenings that take place when you are doing coloring of hair. And these are applications of acids and bases. So that becomes the chemistry of hair as well as the production of chlorine. Basically, this is a read for yourself type of section as I was just putting across for you. All right, the next video is now, I'm gonna be doing questions. And boy, oh boy, am I not excited about that one. So I'll see you now, now when we're doing questions and let's just hang in there. See you soon.